So I will start with archive, and I would like to invite Alison from from archive to present to present archive. Alison, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the time uh, that you're spending with all of us today. Um, so Archive is an open platform um, that researchers around the world use to share and discover um, emerging science and also establish their contribution um, to advancing research. We have a 30 year history in digital open access. Um, we're now uh, hosting more than 2 million scholarly articles. We passed that mark in December and i um, super excited about it. We cover eight major subject areas and um, the most, uh, the subjects that cover the most um, content on archive are um, computer science, math, and physics. Um, but we also cover economics and statistics um, and uh, some others. So, uh, services include article submission, compilation, production, we, um, search and discovery. We distribute um, uh, the articles over uh, the internet. Um, there's also API distribution um, and we curate the collection. So it's not peer reviewed, um, but it is curated by a group of volunteer moderators. Our guiding principles are openness, collaboration, scholarship, and interoperability. Um, and I also should mention that we're based at Cornell University. Next slide. So how does archive work? Um, from the perspective of an individual researcher, you can start over there on the left. Um, the author you know, ha has completed a research project. They have a paper to submit. They go online. They submit it through archive.org. Um, and then it comes into our system. In our system, uh, we have this group of uh, volunteer moderators from around the world. There are more than 200 of them um, who volunteer their time to us and the, and the paper. So they check the paper for basic quality measures. And we also have some automated checks that the papers go through. Then a full text PDF is produced online. Um, and this happens uh, five days a week and um, emails listing the new papers are sent out to subscribers. Um, and I'm also super, super excited to announce um, just this week, we announced that um, Archive is now uh, registering DOIs with Datasite. So each paper receives a DOI that um, it's, it's funny. So in the, uh, in the past ever since our founding in 1991, um, we, uh, we gave each paper an archive ID. This was before the concept of DOIs even existed. <laughs> and, um, and that was a stable way to identify the paper. So that was super useful. But now we found, of course, that DOIs, because they're used across different platforms, um, the DOIs help, help uh, archive become you know, more integrated with the scholarly communications landscape. So, um, so from there, you know, the papers are read and used by researchers around the world um, to discover new ideas, inspire new research, and the cycle continues. Um, I also want to mention that outside of archive, papers might be published in conventional journals, they might be published in overlay journals, they might be used in grant applications, and we have um, several different licenses that authors can choose from so that they can satisfy requirements of journals or funders um that that they you know that they need to be um, in compliance with next slide all right so our our governance structure as i said we're based at cornell university um and we are led by a director a scientific director and our small staff of um of 12 and then we are advised by the member advisory board and the scientific advisory board. So um, members who, you know, institutions that contribute to us are eligible to be on the member advisory board. That's one of the benefits of membership. Next. All right, so our usage. Um, we've had more than 2 billion downloads since 1991. We have about 35 million downloads per month now. As I said, we just passed the 2 million mark for articles. 
Um, and you can see this um, from this graph here that submissions to archive are just <laughs> rising exponentially. And to us, that's that's super exciting because it shows that the services that we're providing are really valued by the research community. Um, we look at it, you know, we don't do peer review, but um, we look at, at the way researchers use archive as being part of the research process. It's a way to get early feedback on work. It's a way to archive their finished work. Um, so, you know, as you can see by the submissions, uh, researchers value that service. So, um, and also submissions originate from 140 countries around the world. Oh, our sustainability issues. Um, as you can see, <laughs> archive submissions have increased exponentially, but our ad admin staffing levels have remained roughly the same. We actually only have four people on staff who um, handle the submissions process. And, um, and we're really feeling the strain of that as the submissions increase. Also, parts of the service rely on decades old code that is not robust or, mod, um, or scalable. And it's, uh, and so we're in this process of, of rewriting um, old code to make it more modern and, um, and uh, uh, interoperable like microservices that, um, that we can update instead of a code base that's sort of every part is reliant on another part. Um, so funding will support open source code, modernized user interfaces, um, streamlined workflows, moving to the cloud. In fact, that's one of our major priorities this year is moving everything to the cloud. Um, we still have some on-premises uh, services. And so in doing, in making all these changes, we're prioritizing maintainability, evolvability, uh, flexibility, and again, this in enhanced interoperability um, with other services. So um, you can see here our pledging target. We have um, different levels for contribution level um, contribution amounts. We, we um, suggest that institutions who want to become members are um, uh, contribute based on their submission usage. Um, so that's why we have the data available online. So for example, like if your institution is in the top 100 institutions around the world submitting to archive, we, um, we suggest a $5,000 a year contribution. Um, oh, and I should mention that on that previous slide, many of those institutions are actually already contributing. So thank you, huge thanks if you're on this call and you're already contributing to Archive. <laughs> We're super grateful. Um, uh, I should mention too that we have the champion level, which is for institutions maybe that have a special open access fund. They are really committed to supporting Archive at a high level. Um, perhaps they're um, an institution whose researchers really, um, really rely on archive um, to do their work. We suggest a higher contribution for those, those institutions. And then we also have the community level because of course we understand that many institutions are facing financial hardship because of COVID and whatnot. Um, so we always have the option to contribute at a lower level if you're financially strapped. Um, and I also wanna take this opportunity to thank um, the Big Ten uh, decided to, to contribute at the champion level this year. So thank you, thank you. Um, California Digital Libraries also agreed to um, contribute at the champion level this year. And we're so happy to welcome um, the Canadian Research Knowledge Network um, that's joining for the first time this year. So um, thank you so much. And thank you, Scos, and all of you uh, for being here and make uh, this campaign possible. Uh, today, I would like to introduce uh, one platform and one initiative, uh, which, uh, well, uh, the both, both of them started in the Latin American region, uh, but now uh, we are working with other regions as well. In the case of Redalic, Redalic is an, uh, a journal index and also an article hosting platform and now committed to Diamond Open Access Journal Publishing. Uh, so we index quality journals 
that are non-APC journals, and we provide different services that complement the capabilities that um, the, the Diamond Open Access journals uh, already have. Uh, uh, well, we have almost 1,500 um, open access peer review journals indexed in our, our platform from a little bit more uh, than 700 institutions, mainly universities, uh, well, yeah, academic institutions in general, uh, from 31 countries. We also index the full text and provide different services in terms of discoverability. Uh, we, uh, our target is to reach 1 million full text articles this year. Uh, the articles that we currently have are from a, a, around 2 million authors from practically all over the world that are uh, publishing in the journals indexed in, in Redalic. The case of Amelica, uh, well, it is an association that has started, um, well, it is so much younger than Redalic. Redalic started in, in 2002 and Amelica, it is started in 2018. And it is an uh, association of different universities and institutions to coordinate efforts to, to support non-commercial uh, non -commercial scholarly communications in terms of uh, well, different services. So the idea is to provide, next please, uh, Agatha, to provide different services that can add value to Diamond Open Access and that can meet and address different needs that uh, journal publishing uh, in the non-commercial sector is uh, facing. So we started with um, a, a quality se selection, uh, which is um, we have different well uh, quality criteria to assess the quality of the journal, uh, where of course the non-APC uh, requirement is mandatory, and also it has uh, the, the journal uh, has to be uh, strong in terms of peer, re peer review, in terms of transparency and many other editorial issues that are assessed at this, uh, at this point of quality. So after that, uh, after this um, a, a evaluation that the journal needs to uh, approve, uh, it passes uh, to a qualitative assessment made by an international uh, council, which is composed of different people from different areas, experts in different fields from different countries. So they can give a qualitative uh, feedback on the journal in order to be indexed in Redalic. After that, we provide a set of uh, tools and different services, for example, in terms of the uh, editorial workflow in, uh, in order to help them to produce XML and PDF and HTML and EPUF in a, for every article they are publishing uh, without any cost. So they can use this um, workflow tools to lower the costs of journal production. And at the same time, we are providing different uh, visibility and discoverability services uh, to help them to uh, be widespread uh, around the world. Uh, so we provide, for example, the integration of Diamond Open Access Journals with institutional repositories, with regional repositories, with thematic repositories, for example, and also with libraries and also with different search engines. So a journal that 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 is publishing in the non-commercial sector uh, can be distributed around the world in their well academic channels and library channels, so to be more visible. We also provide uh, different metrics so journals can um, track the, their usage, the visibility, and also to provide different uh, well ways to compare the community of authors that are participating in each journal and the community of researchers who are consuming the, the literature that is published, published by the journal, and also metrics that can help also uh, well decision makers to to, to see how, uh, for example, the productivity of the researchers, how they are publishing in Diamond Open Access Journals, which is uh, for us very important to let people know that uh, Diamond Open Access is playing an important role. So we provide this kind of metrics for institutions, also for countries. And we are also exploring some services in, in, in linked open data. So we have different collections that are transversal to uh, the Diamond Open Access Journals in order to provide, for example, collections in terms of gender studies, 
and also, uh, for example, with the uh, uh, ODS from, uh, own, from the Agenda 2030. Uh, and all these collections are uh, published in linked open data. So these are, well, the general uh, services uh, infrastructure that we are providing for Diamond Open Access Journals. Next one, please, Agatha. And in the case, very briefly, of Amelika, so we work together in order to provide a, like a framework a, for different institutions to take advantage of non-commercial uh, open access publishing, but also we are extending the technologies to books, uh, the workflows, for example, and also we are covering other branches of open science, for example, the particular case of a community of open uh, of the uh, users of the OJS platform, which is one platform that is very or widely used by uh, journals. For example, we have now a, a little bit more than 600 people registering the community of users and developers of OJS. So they are contributing a code and, and well, a feedback and knowledge around that. So we have different, for example, Aura is another service that is provided by uh, journals the Diamond Journals, which is to um, make their policies in terms of archiving visible. So people can know uh, the, the policies in terms of archiving and author rights for a Diamond Open Access Journals. Next one, please, Agatha. Uh, this is our governance structure. Uh, well, we started as an academic project inside a university, the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico, which is very important to highlight uh, because Redalic uh, uh, it is part of, a, of an academic project. So it started like that, but we are uh, consolidating our governance structures in terms of um, inviting different stakeholders that participate in the uh, decision-making processes, for example. Uh, and also we have uh, started this contributors committee uh, at the time we uh, are participating at, uh, with this cause. This is uh, very new for us because we have been sustained mainly by uh, grants and uh, by money from universities in terms of uh, academic agreements and some other kind of uh, uh, agreements related to academic and research projects. So we are consolidating our platform. And in the case of Amelica, which is a civil association registered in Mexico, uh, we have different institutions uh, that are uh, participating. Uh, they are led by, in this case, by Claxo and Redalic, with the support at the beginning from UNESCO as well. Uh, this is our global usage. Uh, we are providing this service and we have uh, around 12 million average articles downloads per month, uh, which is, uh, and, and it's increasing very, very often, uh, especially during the pandemic time. Uh, so uh, our capacity in our server infrastructure is one of the issues that I'm going to talk about because it is not enough to meet this um, workload of, of users. Uh, we have almost 30 million users, unique users per year. So we have a really, really high, de high demand. And uh, at the time we are indexing more uh, journals from other countries. Now we have also the need to have better um, uh, internet speed, for example, for other regions, which uh, it wasn't uh, our original need, but now we have to attend some of, the, of, of that issues. For example, uh, many users are coming uh, uh, from Africa to, uh, to, to, to read the articles that are in Redalic. So we have to, to improve also the connectivity uh, among uh, regions. Okay, thank you. Well, this is our uh, users worldwide. You can see perhaps we have more um, engagement from users coming from the Spanish or Portuguese speaking countries. But this is really moving since we are open now to other countries in terms of journal indexing. So uh, th this is now moving very, very fast. Now, well, regarding our sustainab sustainability issues, as I mentioned, uh, we have an infrastructure of services, which is 
well, nearly obsolete and also uh, well, insufficient for our current demand. Uh, our communication devices and bandwidth and everything which is in a data center in the in the university, which is a public university in Mexico, it is well not enough uh, to to meet the demand. So these circumstances is, are are causing that the services um, are not the best, don't have the best uh, response uh, of speed and uh, availability sometimes. Uh, and many, for example, many journals now are uh, uh, basing or are uh, relying in Redalic to produce their electronic uh, formats of the journals. So if we stop our service, we really impact, for example, many journals that are producing uh, the, the electronic files, for example, in Redalic. So for us, it's very important to always uh, keep operating. So uh, we have at a high risk of presenting technical deficiencies. Um, and the idea is that uh, the campaign coming from SCOS and uh, the pledges uh, could help us to strengthen the technical infrastructure, particularly the services, communication devices, and bandwidth services that uh, will contribute not only to our uh, availability online, but also to strengthen the infrastructure that uh, help us to keep innovating and to keep developing soft software and to keep uh, you know, producing and generating the metrics and all the background processes that, are, that perform a, a, in, the, in the backstage of Redalic. So we need to upgrade this infrastructure in order to, to, to keep operating and to keep being competitive. Next one, please. Well, this, this is our target. Well, uh, we need this only to um, update our, in our infrastructure. And these are our uh, suggestions for contribution. I have to say that we are very flexible in terms of, uh, well, the, um, the periodicity of, of the contribution and also about, about the amounts, but this is our original uh, suggestions for organizations that are uh, for, from high income, income countries or the small organizations or funding organizations, but uh, well, uh, we are very flexible with that. If you are interested, please contact uh, me or directly to Redalic. We, we have a form also in the webpage. I will leave you the, the link. And well, I think I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, due to the, the, the large number of DSpace installations out there, you might have uh, heard of DSpace already, uh, but I, I hope I'll give you some, some new uh, perspectives and ideas with these uh, with slides. Uh, so as I mentioned, DSpace is, is uh, most likely the, the most adopted uh, repository around the world. Um, it's an open source repository platform. It's been, it's been out there for, for a few years now and uh, over 3,000 installations that we know of um, based on the registry of, of, of this space, but most likely there are many more than that. And uh, it's free to use, free to download, and it's, uh, it's a community-led uh, program and it's based on community contributions. So uh, it's ex extremely important for us to have the chance to uh, reach out to the community of users and uh, and explain why it is important they they are part of of all of this. Uh, again, please next slide. Now, I want to start the this this presentation uh, uh, thinking. I mean, talking about uh, different concepts. I mean, uh, because the idea the governance is working on, uh, the, the DSpace governance is working on, is to rethink the, the role of repositories in our, in our ecosystem. Uh, because for several reasons that are happening out there, and, and uh, some are uh, definitely impactful for our life as well, uh, the repositories themselves are, are, are getting kind of a new life. So when, when we think about an open infrastructure as, as the open source uh, DSpace repository, we have to consider many different aspects, as, as you probably know. Uh, one is obviously that it's part of a broader uh, ecosystem, that is the research life cycle, because it serves the institutions in different ways and deposit uh, uh, papers and publications. 
uh, then if it's open, you need to consider the protocols and the standards of different technologies in order to interoperate with other systems that are, that are out there. Um, you're part of an even broader ecosystem, which is the academic ecosystem in general, and the, uh, where, where the repositories are usually used. Um, you have to build the software, you have to provide some services. And then the, the concept of op openness is, uh, is, again, it's broader than than what we have been used to in, in the past 20 years, I would say, when it started with the idea of, it is an open source, of course, and uh, as, um, everything started particularly with, uh, with this space, with the idea of open access. Now it is about open science, which is broader, open data. Um, then you need to be open to other systems and to interoperability and API. It's, it's a good way to exchange data and information. Uh, it's open in terms of open mind because the people behind the repository, especially for the for the purpose that the repository serve, uh, they're, they're very much uh, open minded people trying to to work in an interconnected world. Uh, systems should be open. Um, uh, it's open because it's global, so anyone can access it from anywhere around the world. And because we are creating a global community here. And so, because it, it is also community built, uh, it's open in terms of the governance is open and it's transparent, uh, so that anyone can chip in and and be part of the decision making process. Uh, next slide, uh, Agatha, please. Uh, so, um, um, I mentioned that the repository is part of a, a broader ecosystem, and um, the idea it is somehow to. Uh, rethink the role of repository, as I mentioned. So the repository, uh, for, for many years, it's it's been a place where you store uh, publications or, or and and, uh, and papers, and um, uh, but uh, for each one of them, there's so much more uh, involved uh, because it's a place where ideas are stored. It's it's a place where research is made and shared and. And, and discussed. Uh, it's a place where researchers meet and, and learn something new. It's a place where you share the information you have. And when all of this becomes uh, uh, a, a, some sort of interoperable system or interconnected, all these pieces of data becomes information, valuable information for institutions to manage and to make decisions uh, on, on, on top of them and using them because uh, you can have uh, links to all the other systems in the, in the institutions that can feed the repository and the repository can feed them back uh, with, valuable, with valuable data information. And at the end of the day, it becomes a strategic tool for the institution themselves. Uh, next slide, please. And so be, before I get a little bit more into the space itself, and this is basically a disclaimer for my own uh, presentation. Um, so the governance of this space, which I, I, I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, is very focusing on switching the role of repositories now. And uh, the, the latest release, this space 7, really moves toward that direction, adopting um, uh, the recommendations, the, 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 the global recommendations that are coming from uh, international organizations in order uh, to develop something that is really up to, up to date in terms of uh, standards and protocols. Because uh, as I mentioned uh, before, the repository is a strategic tool for, for institutions that supports the mission of them. And it's not just a static uh, um, uh, place where you archive uh, data, but it's uh, it's uh, what I call a data agora, where where data meets and becomes something more and more useful. Um, when we build up a repository, when we when we improve this space, uh, we can consider it as a standalone technology because it's obviously part of, of an ecosystem or an infrastructure that is, that is broader than a, a piece of repository. Um, we have always to look at the big picture and try to create partnership with other organizations in order to understand uh, what's new and uh, how to bring the repositories to the next level. And uh, we always have to keep an eye open, uh, talking about openness, uh, for standards and protocols, and, and most importantly, 
uh, when we talk about open source as all the technologies we're talking about here and, and everything that's cost support, we need to look at them as a collective responsibility. So obviously they're free, obviously they're available, but they're there for a reason. And they're there because you're here as well uh, to support them. So that's, that's the kind of a framework that we want to support. Next slide, please. So the, 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 how this, this platform uh, survive uh, and how this is, this is try somehow to, to move ahead is, as I mentioned, this space is a community-led uh, program. It's always been like this. So um, uh, it's the members and the users who contribute to think about the future of the technology, where it should go and how. Uh, it should go there, it should get there. So anything is about the community. They, they contribute code, they, they contribute money, and they contribute ideas. And uh, the, the ideas go through different uh, vehicles and paths, and uh, finally they get to the leadership group. And the leadership group is a members-based organization uh, structure, and they are the ones who, who make the final decisions on, on this space and approves or rejects what the steering group present. The steering group is a subgroup of the leadership. Um, today, there are over 20 leaders uh, in this space from over 10 different countries. Uh, I, I'll get to the, to the distribution of countries later on, but this is one of the strengths of this space. As a global organization present in over 120 countries, it's important to have that kind of representation. Um, there are different ways to get involved. It's not just the governance, it's also the different working groups and, and user groups. Next slide, please. I mentioned the global, the global uh, usage and distribution of this space, and I mentioned that, that, that we know of 3,000 inst installations around the world. But it's even more important for us is that there are hundred, at least 120 countries where this space is currently used. And that's why it is important to think about it as a global infrastructure. If we manage to make them all connected somehow, uh, the, I mean, the, the strength of the platform will be even, even stronger, even higher. And uh, there are currently, uh, this space is, is developed in 20 different languages, uh, which is uh, it's just a great result. And out of those 120 countries, in, in, a, in a few of them, like a, a small percentage, if you think of it, of it but uh, we have established user groups, national user groups that are helping us moving the project forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, and this is what I mentioned about the user groups. Uh, this is something new. Uh, we started working on it uh, uh, 20 years ago because basically we, we found out that um, uh, this space as a community, it was, uh, uh, it was formed by several different communities. So we, we refer to it as a community of communities. Because even if we didn't know about uh, them, they existed in different countries. And so what we're trying to do is to create engagement uh, with the different national communities to bring their ideas and needs and, and expectations of, from the software uh, to the governance. And not all of them obviously are part of, of the decision-making process, but in this way, we're trying to open up the access to, to, to this process. We're trying to organize lots of events and webinars. Uh, obviously, in the past two years, there have been more webinars than in-person events uh, for uh, obvious reasons. Um, but we try to um, uh, translate documentation in different languages for the users and for the developers, trying to engage in conversation with them. We're trying to bring uh, information to, to different countries. So a big thank to all the national user group coordinators they're doing a fantastic job in helping us reaching out to the, to the users and supporting them. Um, uh, obviously, this space, as, as I mentioned, is a global platform. Uh, it's important to, for, 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 the, for the community to create partnership or relationship with other uh, organizations um, uh, in the world. Uh, we are partnering with, with a few, which are extremely important for our ecosystem. As some of them I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, La Referencia in Latin America, uh, Core, Open Air, and Eurocrease, they're all part of the same ecosystem or trying to support uh, openness in many different forms and all trying to support research activities in many different forms. Uh, one is the large community. So it's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic added value for, for the project and for the software itself. 
but it's also very hard to, to manage, especially because many institutions, they don't have uh, access to membership or they're not, they're not providing any kind of support. And so most of the big institutions are, are, are trying to support uh, what we're doing. So we need to broaden up uh, the, the participation, the membership, and cost is really, really helpful for that. Uh, the other problem is with the technology itself. Uh, the last release, which was by far the largest release in the history of this space, um, uh, it took us a long time because there haven't been um, a much technical and development contribution uh, as we expected, because we are relying on the support of a couple of service providers, which are fantastic because they allow us to, to move the platform forward, but we need more contribution from the technical side as well. And, uh, and the membership model in some countries uh, is under pressure. And, uh, and so we need to find different ways and different paths to support uh, 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 open source platforms that, as, as I mentioned before, are, are collective responsibilities. Um, so uh, through the support of SCOFs, we, we want to get to the point of being able to hire a community manager and to hire a, a, junior, a junior developer for this space in order to support those, those three aspects. Uh, last slide, this is about the pledging. And uh, I mean, uh, we are here to, to try to get some extra support. Uh, I mentioned the reasons why you're looking for it. And uh, there are many other reasons that we don't have time to go through uh, all of them now. There are different options. And as uh, per uh, uh, every uh, project uh, supported by SCOS, we have obviously also discount for consortium membership. And, uh, and uh, if you have other questions, we will be happy to uh, answer. And uh, you can contact us at this space, uh, scars at lyricist.org. Uh, thank you very much again for being here. Uh, hope to hear from you soon. <laughs>